So, good morning, everybody, um, and uh, welcome to this first EOSC Secretariat uh, webinar. Uh, this morning, uh, our title is Building the European Open Science Cloud, a deep dive into the European Open Science Cloud working groups and engagement opportunities with the EOSC Secretariat project. So, you can see a number of faces, I think, uh, down the side of the, the, the screen. Um, and Indeed, we have a number of um, the EOSC executive board joining us for this webinar and also people from the EOSC Secretariat uh, project. So today, our webinar basically looks at an introduction to um, the EOSC executive board, in particular regarding a brand new document which is available on the EOSC Secretariat website called the EOSC Strategic Implementation Plan. And we're joined by the executive board uh, co-chair Catherine Stover and also joined by Sarah Jones who is one of the five working group chairs who are taking forward the, the objectives of the implementation plan which sees the implementation stage and a future vision for the European Open Science Cloud. There'll be plenty of time during the webinar for questions and answers. We have two, two little blocks of questions and answers for, for you all and uh, and then we'll be joined by Andrea Grazilla, who is the project manager for the EOSC Secretariat project. And he'll be talking a bit about some of the engagement opportunities that there are available in the EOSC Secretariat project, which looks to support the work of the executive board and the EOSC governance. My name is Nick Ferguson and I'm the, the chair today. So I'll be uh, dealing with the, a lot of the questions which are coming in and uh, Clearly, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. We've got a lot of people who have registered for the webinar. Uh, and in the sessions, we'll also be joined by some of the working group chairs. Uh, we have Jean-Francois uh, Abram Abram Abramatic, who is joining us uh, as well. He is the chair of the um, architecture working group. And also Jan Hrusak, who is chair of the landscape working group. If you'd like to ask a question, then uh, please use the uh, panel uh, that you see on the, uh, on the interface. Uh, click on Q&A and you can, you can ask your question and, and we'll either deal with them in the Q&A sessions or uh, live in the, in the chat if that, is, if that is at all possible. So we've had a, a lot of interest in this first webinar. We've had 342 registrants from across Europe. So this shows the, I think the interest in there in the European Open Science Cloud across Europe. And we've got a good breakdown of, uh, of where people come from as well in terms, of, in terms of their background. And of course, a, a large amount of researchers are joining us today. I'm very pleasing on, for this webinar today, we have a higher ratio of females joining us than men, which is I think a, a, an important message and a, an important achievement as well. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Catherine Stover, who, as I said, is uh, the representative from Giant on the executive board, and she is the co-chair of the executive board as well. She'll be also joined by, by Sarah Jones, who is uh, the chair of the FAIR Working Group, and she is the associate director of the Digital Curation Centre. So I'd like to hand over to, to Catherine for, for this next presentation. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everybody out there. Um, as Nick was saying, uh, the presentation today is, my part of the presentation today is a summary of the strategic implementation plan, a document which we've just uh, agreed in the executive board and which has also received approval from the governance board members. Uh, this document is available from the EOS Secretariat website and I'm sure in the presentation we will give you the link to this document. But I, my plan today is to give you a quick overview of what this strategic implementation plan is all about. And here, first of all, I have to give thank yous to Sarah Jones, who wrote this document together with uh, Jean-Francois Abramatic. So next slide, please. Um, one of the important things that when we look at the EOSC is, of course, that uh, even though the governance 
structure for the EOSC has only been created uh, in November last year, we are still looking back at quite a four years of uh, the European Open Science Cloud in various documents coming from the European Commission, where we have council decisions and the like towards the EOSC, but also many projects which have received funding from Horizon 2020 over the last three years. This is something that we need to bear in mind when we look at the EOSC uh, um, executive board work in the sense that uh, projects are ongoing, council decisions have meaning, and the executive board has to find its way through these Horizon 2020 projects and towards the future of Horizon Europe. So this is why we've written this strategic, strategic implementation plan. Uh, next slide, please. What is the opportunity that we see? Well, the opportunity is, of course, that science is global. Science needs to be supported as best as we can. And the way we do science has changed. So there, is, um, there used to be the way that uh, scientists work with each other via peer reviews, editing, publication, services, libraries. There used to be the internet. And the EOSC is now to organize the internet in a way that the steps that scientists need to work together are found in, in one, uh, one easy access. Next slide, please. So many people have been asking why the EOSC and uh, what we've put together here is actually um, those reasons that uh, when discussing with the governance board together with the European Commission and the executive board, we found are the reasons of why Europe needs a European Open Science Cloud. Um, there is a need for the digital transformation of science. There is a need to empower the millions of European researchers to reap the benefits of data-driven science. We want to build an open research data commons in Europe, which is widely inclusive across all sorts of disciplines, member states and associate states. We need to give Europe a global lead in research data management, and we need to help developing an internet of fair digital objects. And Sarah, of course, will be talking a little bit more about fair as well. We want to reduce the fragmentation by federating existing research infrastructures, and that includes the e-infrastructures, enable interdisciplinary research to address societal challenges, and enable the digital single market and stimulate the emergence of competitive EU cloud sector. Next slide, please. And then, of course, there's the question, what is the EOSC? And I think here it becomes very interesting. It's a trusted and open virtual environment for the scientific community with seamless access to services, addressing the whole research data lifecycle. I think that sum summarizes it very well. We want to have fair competition. We don't want to have any lock-in by individual service providers. We want this to be free at the point of use for the researcher. It needs to be user-oriented and inclusive. I think that's the important bit, that the scientist needs to be in the middle of the EOSC. It needs to be accessible through a non-exclusive, simple and universal gateway. It needs to be governed by a minimal set of rules of participations, and it needs to be steered by governance based on increasing mutuality. Next slide. So what we really want to achieve is an open festival for science. We want to create a virtual space where science producers and science consumers can come together, which is inclusive to people of all backgrounds and cultures, which is open-ended range of content and services, and which has a quality mark of data made in Europe. I think this is very important that we, uh, we remain, we have data made in Europe. At this point in time, this data made in Europe is available. But how do we ensure this data made in, available in Europe is available to everybody in Europe, across disciplines, across country borderlines, and in the future? Next slide. The important bit is that we have realized that the EOS can only grow in stages. We need to develop the underlying infrastructure, which is owned and operated publicly. We need to extend to engage with private initiatives. We need to have rules and uphold common European values, and we need to create a living, breathing system that adapts to change. Next slide. What are the design principles? I think the design principle, the most important one, is called bit by bit. We are fully aware that we cannot design a fully-fledged EOSC from day one. 
it needs to build on something small and it needs to be building bit by bit. But our design principles are very clear. We want to have this co-created. We need to have this research led. Unless the scientists are convinced that the EOSC makes a difference to their scientific life, nobody will come and use it. So it needs to be community driven. It needs to have flexibility inbuilt by design. Over time, it needs to be extensible and scalable in its architecture. It needs to be incremental and iterative and hands-on and particip participatory. And we need to have continuous engagement, consultation, and user testing. Next slide, please. So the driving principles for implementation are very simple. They are really three driving principles. The EOS wants to be cooperative. It is built on voluntary participation, and it needs to be in the common interest for all of us. Next slide. The decision-making process. Decisions need to be made open. We need to have processes which are open to all interested and informed parties. And I think this webinar is the first step towards that. We need to achieve broad consensus. Uh, we need to have uh, a platform which allows for all views to be considered. We need to have full transparency that the stakeholders would provide public notice of proposed development activities and conditions for participation. We need to have easily accessible records of decisions. It needs to be balanced. Activities will not be exclusively dominated by any particular person, organization, or interest group. And we need to have due process in our decision makings. We need to, of course, also have periodic reviews and updating uh, when necessary. Next slide, please. If you look at the governance structure, um, many people have looked at this slide, it's quite complex. Um, and as I said before, the EOSC is embedded into existing council decisions, existing EC rules, and existing H2020 projects that will transform into Horizon Europe projects. So the governance structure consists mainly of the governance board and the executive board, what you see in the middle of the slide here. And the governance board are, of course, delegates from member states and associate countries and the European Commission. The executive board is um, European stakeholder organizations and individual experts. And some of them are here today. We have the working groups, which will come out of the executive board, and we have the stakeholder forum. So all of this needs to work together in order to make the EOS governance structure workable and in order to um, have a result of the EOSC in a viable option at the end. Next slide. A few more words to the governance board. So we have in the governance board representatives from all 28 member states of the European Union and of 10 associated countries. The governance board is chaired by Hans-Josef Linkens of the BMBF in Germany. And they have been forming subgroups to, the, to feed strategic inputs into the EOSC. These subgroups should not be defined, uh, confused with the working groups. The subgroups are internal governance board only groups. If you want to see who is your representative on the uh, EOS governance board, we make a, um, a pointer here available. The European Commission has now published all of those governance board members who have disclosed their membership. Next slide, please. On the executive board, uh, we have uh, the pictures of all of us here. Um, Karel Lauben is chair, I'm the co-chair. We have eight representatives of stakeholder groups and three independent experts. And again, if you, find our, if you want to read our biographies or find out more from us, the information is available from the EOS Secretariat website. Next slide. We would like to engage uh, in communications uh, I, we believe it's very important uh, that we have two-way communications and I see that uh, the chat is filling and there's also some question and answers which we hope to be answering right now. Um, we don't want to broadcast. Um, at this point in time a lot of broadcasting has possibly been going on but we want to change that. We want to engage more with the community. Uh, we have planned also stakeholder events in which we can um, talked directly with the community. One will be taking place in, um, in October in Helsinki and another one will take place in November in Budapest. Next slide. 
So we need a strong and consistent communication strategy. This needs to include, obviously, also the Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, we appreciate that at this point in time, we have a lot of stakeholders coming from all sorts of different environments and uh, everybody speaks a different language. You speak a different language if you come out of an e-infrastructure background such as myself or data background such as Sarah. So we need to be able to speak the languages of all of our stakeholders. We want to use as many of our existing communications channels to reach the scale. We would like to start developing a collectively owned EOS brand. And uh, it is critically important to be talking to stakeholders at all times. And this webinar is just the first of the series. And at this point in time, we're planning to set up a group between the executive board and the governance board, the EOS secretariat, the European Commission to manage uh, improved communications. But we already have, um, next slide please, Nick. We already have some key documents where you can follow our work. Uh, one is the strategic implementation plan uh, on which this presentation was built. I think it is very important that uh, you have a look at this document. We will also be very shortly, certainly before the summer, um, distribute the EOS work plan, which will give you more input, uh, insight into the exact work that we are doing. The working group remits have been published on the EOS Secretariat website. And so far, I think I've been writing five blocks about all of our meetings that we've had as ex executive board, where you can follow our work in progress. And I think that's from my side. Um, with that, I'll be handing over to Sarah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, so what I'm going to do for the remainder of this talk is um, go through the working groups that we've got set up so far. And you can see on this slide the, the five topics that we're addressing to date. Um, landscape, looking at what's going on in the different member states, defining the rules of participation, architecture and fair, which kind of together comprise the core infrastructure and building blocks of the EOSC, looking at the technical and, and also the social and kind of disciplinary practices, and also sustainability, trying to underpin everything, making sure we have a viable EOSC going forward. And we try to represent some of the dependencies between those groups here. As Katrin said, you can see the working group remits online. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through each of these groups separately. So you can go ahead. Um, so the first group is landscape. This is chaired by Jan Krusak, who's the ESFRI chair. And essentially what this group is doing, it's looking at what's going on in the different member states to see how we can kind of converge and align the different um, initiatives and infrastructures that are being supported. So the, the national research infrastructures, the different ESFRIs or thematic clouds, and also looking at alignment of policies as well. And you can see we've got a little bit, bit of misformatting here, but you can see basically on the timeline at the bottom, um, Within this year at quarter three, there'll be an initial mapping um, and then that will be updated at quarter four with um, what's happening in the 5B projects. So they're the national initiatives that are being supported under the infra EOSC program. And then the work of the landscape group will really go hand in hand with sustainability and together they'll look at the readiness of the different member states, um, both in terms of the infrastructure they support, but also the financial resourcing and their readiness to feed into a sustainable EOSC. And then if we go to the next slide, the second group is rules of participation. This is chaired by Juan Bicaregui, who's the representative for the Research Data Alliance. Juan was also involved in the EOSC pilot project. So he'd already been looking at the rules of participation in that context. And really what these rules are about, it's about defining the different rights and obligations and accountability of all of the different users of the EOSC. So the end users, people who are coming to use data or use different services, as well as the providers, both of data and services, and the different operators who run and facilitate that EOSC platform. And really what, what we're in, involved in with the rules of participation is making sure that we have good quality and accessible quality of services and data. And again, you can see the timeline here. There's already some strong inputs for this working group. 
based on what's gone on in the EOSC pilot project. By quarter three of this year, they'll have the objectives of the rules of participation and they'll have a proposal for an initial set of rules um, by the end of 2019. And then we'll have a phase where they're tested and, and kind of iteratively developed and a final version will be released at quarter four of 2020. And then the next slide. The third group is architecture, which is led by Jean-Francois Abramatic. Um, and he's here on the webinar. So if you have specific questions, he'll be able to pick those up later on. The architecture group is looking specifically at the technical framework we need to enable and sustain the EOSC. So it's really defining that interoperability layer that allows us to federate the different systems that are already in place. And you can see under the how element here, um, there are a number of aspects of work that will go on within this group. So it's defining and um, bringing together those core services, looking at open source APIs so we can connect up um, and exchange data and services, developing the portal further, looking at different standards for, for data description and best practices. Again, you can see um, there's some work that will take place and be delivered at the end of this year. The initial federating core, uh, a registry of data infrastructure and an updated catalog. Um, this will be developed further in the early parts of 2020. So we have a preliminary connection of most of the um, EOSC infrastructure and services by then. And then together with other groups, um, the architectural working group will feed into the interoperability framework and also the PID policy. And then the next slide. Um, the fourth group is the FAIR working group, which is the one that I chair. Here, we're really looking at providing recommendations on how we implement FAIR um, and also feeding requirements into other groups for the rules of participation or for the architecture group. Because what we want to do is, is foster that cross-disciplinary interoperability. And really, FAIR is about trying to enable us to connect up the different people and data and services within the EOSC by use of standards across the board. So really, FAIR is the kind of glue that brings everything together. You can see the different activities we have under this kind of how section. We'll be looking at the different data standards and practices in different communities, trying to upscale those to feed into the work on the interoperability framework. We'll also be looking at persistent identifier policy and the different metrics and frameworks to assess fair data and, and certified services. And again, you can see our timeline, like the um, rules of participation and other groups, we'll be having a kind of first preliminary release of the PID policy and metrics for fair data and services this year. And then we'll test those iteratively um, and release an updated version at the end of next year. And the kind of core, one of the core deliverables in our group is this EOSC interoperability framework, which we're doing in collaboration with others. And then the final group is sustainability. It's arguably the most important of them all because we need to make sure that EOSC is viable long term. It's a sustainability um, is run by Rupert and also Connor O'Carroll on behalf of Science Europe. Um, he, um, he's stepping in at the moment because Stephen Custer's just stepped down from Science Europe and a new director will be starting, I think, um, in the autumn. So the sustainability is looking at providing the strategic, legal and, and financing recommendations for the EOSC. Um, and it's really about ensuring that it's sustainable going forward. And there are two key areas of work. Um, they'll be looking at analyzing the different business models and legal entities. Um, and then also investigating the potential governance frameworks. And you can see on their timeline, um, it focuses more on the second year because there isn't as much work that's gone on in this area. They'll be taking a lot of inputs from the um, landscape group and they'll be doing um, also external studies. There should be some consultancy reports feeding into this. So that in quarter one of 2020, they can um, have an initial analysis of the different business models, refine the different options, and by quarter three, provide recommendations on the strategic and financing options going forward. So if we jump to the next slide, um, that gives you an overview of the five groups. Um, 
And what I've tried to do is in summary here is, is list the key elements that we'll be working on. So by the end of 2020, we should have the agreed and tested rules of participation. Um, we'll have the analysis of the existing national infrastructures and policies, which then feeds into the recommendations about the financing model and legal entity and the governance structure. In terms of the architecture and fair work, um, we'll have the functioning federating core of initial services and the catalogues to both data and services and this interoperability framework. So a set of kind of open APIs and specifications and protocols to enable us to, to do the data exchange, the persistent identifier policy and the metrics for fair data and services. Now, one thing that isn't flagged here, which um, will be um, set up as a group is around the skills. Um, so we haven't missed that. It's just a group that we didn't set up initially. The, the governance board wanted us to, to focus on a few groups initially, but um, we are planning to start a skills group and potentially some others too. So next slide. So this is the work plan. You can see essentially how things map out here. Um, we have some initial outputs coming in this first year. Um, and then if you just press again, you'll get a little animation come up. What I wanted to focus on with this slide is the fact that things are going to be iteratively kind of consulted on and tested and refined. And that's really the way we want to work. We do want to engage a lot with the stakeholder community so that what is then put forward in the second half of um, 2020 has all of your inputs and is something that you agree is viable and is, is workable for the EOSC. So next slide. So where we're at with the working groups, um, we have had nominations to the different groups. Most of the nominations have come from the governance board, so from the different member states. Some nominations have come from the executive board, um, specifically in the um, fair working group. There were some people I wanted to add to that based on knowledge I knew they had. We've had some nominations by projects too um, that have fed into the architecture working group. And we um, are going to have some open calls for a few of the groups for architecture fair and rules of participation. And um, we may also call in different experts or Horizon 2020 projects or consult, um, how do you like consultancy reports where needed to feed into the work we're doing. Okay, next slide. So here you can see a representation in numbers, um, how many people we have on the different groups. The architecture and fair groups um, have a larger number so far because we've taken on um, different Horizon 2020 representatives or brought additional people on ourselves. Um, Across all of the groups, we've got about just short of 100, I think 98 um, members, about a third of them are female. And we also have quite a good representation of the different member states. Um, there are some more of Eastern Europe that isn't as represented. So that's something we'd like to address in the open calls, try and get broader geographic um, inputs as well. The so next slide. So the status of the working groups just now, um, we've all either had an initial meeting or scheduled a first meeting. Um, some people have had telcons, other face-to-face -face meetings are coming up over the summer. And what we're doing in these first meetings is establishing who's going to do what, identifying any missing skills across the membership, and also planning how we will engage with the projects. The next slide. So I mentioned we will have an open call that will happen for three of the groups. It wasn't felt it was appropriate for the sustainability and the landscape groups because these are um, more of a concern of the member states and they already have strong inputs from those groups. But what we'll prioritize with the open call is filling the missing skills gap. So um, the call will be specific about what skills we already have in the working groups and what we're looking for. Um, you'll be invited to apply by submitting your CV and a short statement of what you will bring to the group. Um, and we expect that, that open call to, to be open in late summer. And then the, the next steps really, this diagram comes from the governance structure. And what I've done is I've pulled out an element I want to emphasize. Um, and it's this little, in, in the diagram, it's a little tiny arrow which says interact. And it's about the interaction between the, the governance, the executive board and the working group specifically, and all of those who are building the EOSC, all of the people 
you know, running the projects or doing national initiatives or the extended coalition of the doers. And I think that interaction is really the critical element of making this work. We need to reach out to the different Horizon 2020 projects and national initiatives and coalition of doers because we're really dependent on you. You know, the, the working groups need your inputs and we need to kind of try and help coordinate and make recommendations to adopt the practice coming out of, of your your efforts and I think it's collectively that we will make the EOS successful and build something that's really viable. So the final slide kind of call to arms I, I think what we should do is really emphasize um, getting the show on the road and, and making some progress on this so you will hear much more from us um, as we get these um, working groups underway with our initial meetings and as Catherine had said earlier we really want to do a lot of stakeholder engagement and really have you help us shape the future of, of the EOS. So thank you very much that's all I had to say um, so I think we can take questions I see various things have popped up in chat so I don't know if Nick or Sarah yeah. wants to coordinate that. Yes hello so um, thank you very much Sarah and thank you very much uh, Catherine so we've got uh, a lot of questions coming in. Uh, thank you very much for those. So what we're going to do is try and deal with a set of these uh, now with the with the uh, with the working group chairs and with Catherine as the as the, the co-chair of the executive board. Uh, the first question. So please bear with us. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so the first question is from Elizabeth uh, Albrecht, and apologies for any pronunciation errors. Uh, the, the 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 question is. Um, who is the holder of the cloud itself um, and who is going to provide the cloud? This is what the question means and the cloud space. So um, who would like to answer that question? I can um, try and give an answer here. I think the important element of the EOSC uh, executive board and governance board as we sit together at this point in time needs to be to really understand where we're coming from. We're coming from an environment of Horizon 2020 projects uh, where of course cloud activities, uh, e infrastructure integrations, uh, all these sort of things have been funded in the past through Horizon 2020. The distinct difference that we see now that the governance board uh, or the governance structure of the EOSC has been launched is the interaction between the executive board as a European level with the European Commission and the governance board, which means the government's activities uh, um, in, the, in the EOSC. And what we see here is that all governments across Europe, a large, a large extent of them are getting ready for an open science environment in their own country. And in the end, uh, the EOSC in that respect will be federated across uh, the member states and the associate countries. So if I look into the future, I don't think there will be a single holder for anything. I think it will be uh, a distributed environment uh, based on national open science infrastructures. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to pick up on, on that answer from Catherine? Which I think was pretty comprehensive. No, sounds good to me. Okay, so the question, the next question is a little more specific and it's on funding. So the question is, can you share some high level information on, on your funding? Um, by what mechanisms do you receive funding? And what mechanisms do you think you'll be receiving funding in the future? So, um, I open that up. Uh huh. Um, um, yeah. So, how do you want to go? Sure. Um, I, I was just going to say so, uh, there's been lots of investment in um, the EOSC from the European Commission. So, all of lots of projects funded under the different programs. Um, and also, member states have been making investments. And I think the aim within EOSC is to try and coordinate that. So, funding will come from, from governments. But I think if we build something really viable, there will be other. Um, sources of funding because effectively we'll, we'll build a strong marketplace that others want to come and provide services in. So I think um, it will have a range of um, funding options in the future. Thank um, you. I want to comment on that too. Yeah, anyone, anyone else would like to comment on that? Andrea, did you want to comment on the 
secretariat in this or just very quickly? Yes. Um, of course, many initiatives have been, have been funded across Europe uh, according to several disciplines and member states initiatives, even sometimes local initiatives. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, activities that have been described by Catherine and Sarah uh, in their presentations, especially related from inputs coming from the executive board and working groups, the actual support is provided through the EU Secretariat, which is an Horizon 2020 project. So uh, this is the main uh, driver for the actual funding for this kind of uh, activities. Uh, of course, uh, the future of the EUSC will be at the center of the discussion for the next Horizon uh, Europe uh, funding framework. So there we will see which kind of uh, valid financing tools will be uh, put in place for the actual construction and running of EUSC. Thank you very much, Andrea. So, um, should we move on to the, the next question? So the next question focuses a little bit on the services. So there's a specific question to, to Catherine um, about uh, one of her slides, in slide 12, it says underlying infrastructures have to be built. Um, Catherine, would you be able to, to specify uh, what is meant by underlying infrastructure, please? Um, yeah, I mean, I see this question comes from Ivan Maric. Um, first of all, I think it, um, you know, I have been saying a couple of times, and I will say it now again, I don't think that the e-infrastructure in the context of EOSC are the issue or the challenge. I think the integration and the working of uh, European e-infrastructures, uh, we've been working for many years, and I think we will continue to do that. Um, I think the, when, we talk about the infra, when we talk about infrastructures here, we really look at uh, integrating the e-infrastructures with the data infrastructures, and that is something that um, I don't think is solved yet. Uh, making data infrastructures available across disciplines um, is something we need to look at. And I think that is where the architecture working group and also the, the FAIR and the rules of participation working groups will, will have to do some, um, some, some substantial work to ensure that this main objective of making data available across disciplines, across country borders, to scientists across Europe, um, is going to be achieved. So I think that's what's meant um, by this statement. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to add anything there? Okay, so the, um, the next question is about a very important um, stakeholder group, which are res researchers themselves. Um, so the, the EOSC focuses on researchers as, as one of the key, key stakeholders and key, key targets. Um, but researchers are all often already using their university or high school or research center ICT. The question is, are you planning to integrate these uh, IT teams into a European open science cloud in one or other level and avoid shadow IT? So Jean-Francois may want to answer to this as well, but um, I, I think this is a really critical aspect. I don't think we can ask researchers to change what they're doing. You know, if people are well served already by institutional infrastructure or by disciplinary data services, um, we should be working at a higher level to bring those together, but not in a way that makes researchers change their practice. Um, so the EOSC is the idea of that federation uh, is that we're connecting up and making it work kind of in the background under the hood rather than having you know like one portal one service that everybody has to come and use um so i i think you know the researcher for me is a really critical stakeholder and i think we have to make sure that what we do is fit for purpose for researcher practice okay jean francois did you want to add anything or are you quite happy with Sarah's? I think we're good. Okay, so um, so uh, so now a, a bit of a, a topical question. Um, so, big issue uh, today is the application of the General Data Protection Regulation. 
uh, many researchers, or, or GDPR, many researchers are reluctant to use a cloud system. Um, um, sorry, one second, my question's disappeared. Ah, here it is, yes. Uh, what is the impact of the GDPR? Uh, and will the European Open Science Cloud be compliant with it? So I can speak to that if you like. I mean, it has to be compliant with it because it's, it's legislation that we all have to follow. I think one of the misnomers people have about things like EOSC is that it's all open um, and it, it can't be because for certain types of data, um, you need restrictions on access or you need to keep, well, you always need to keep things secure as well. Um, so yeah, it, it has to work in a way that enables people to transfer sensitive data or to work on sensitive data too. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now what we'll do is we'll, so we've started a group of questions on services. What we'll do is work next on some questions on specifically about the working groups. So um, the first question is, uh, how will you plan uh, coordinate and announce all of the meetings for the working groups? Uh -huh. um, so I think things may differ slightly with the different um, working groups because the remits vary and the, the way in which we'll engage with stakeholders might vary. Um, certainly for, for my own one, for FAIR, we're, we're planning monthly telcons um, and we're planning um, a few face-to-face -face meetings a year. So we have our first face-to-face -face meeting on the 4th of July. Um, I would certainly like the face-to-face -face meetings to be, um, you know, in a public calendar so people know when they're coming up and, and we'll actively engage with projects so people can submit inputs beforehand um, so that they know um, what, what support we might be looking for. Um, but they won't be open meetings, they'll be just for the working group. We will um, blog about them though so that people know what's happening and, and can um, get regular news and updates. But for, for other groups, they may not publish. I know some things around like the governance model and legal entity are, are more sensitive and you, you need to make sure that things aren't publicized before there's common agreement and consensus. So um, I, not every group may work in exactly the same way. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. And, and in fact, the next question is uh, regards to the open call you mentioned in your presentation that some of the groups will be having an open call and, and as you've just said others, others it's not uh, appropriate so um, the question is will the, will the open calls be restricted to people from member states and uh, are there any, any other restrictions? Um, I'm trying to think if there are restrictions so we haven't restricted it to people from member states so on the fair working group we do have um, an international member personally I think that's really useful because we need to make sure that EOSC um, you know interacts with other regional um, and uh, national science commons or science platforms so um, I don't think it would be limited to member states but um, there would probably be different terms. So for instance, our international member, we, we aren't reimbursing travel if they come to face-to-face -face meetings. Um, other restrictions? I, I think the main restriction will just be that people need the relevant skills. That's our, our baseline criteria, um, that we're trying to fill skills gaps and trying to make sure we maintain good balance and representativeness of different stakeholder communities and sectors. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we've had a couple of other questions on specific points regarding the working groups. So what I suggest we do is we get back to um, individually on, on those questions because some of them are quite, quite specific. Um, we'll move on just to a couple of questions on, on stakeholders now. And here's a, here's a nice one for perhaps for you, for you all. Um, who do you see as your most important stakeholders? Mm -hmm. We might all be saying the same here because I can see, did Catherine answer it in the chat already saying scientists? And uh, I would say the same, Jean-Francois, I think is pushing the same line. <laughs> I mean, we, we need engagement of various stakeholder groups, but ultimately this is for scientists. So you have to have the users at the center. Yeah, I mean, that is the the one success criteria for, for, the sign, uh, for, for the EOSC. If the scientists cannot find anything useful in it and don't come and use it, 
then the whole thing, um, you know, has no use. Uh, we are here to support European science, European research. That is what the EOSC is about. Okay, thank, thank you. So uh, there's another specific question. So who, who do you exactly see uh, as the users? Um, are, research re are research infrastructures users, providers, or both? And how is this reflected in the governance? I would say they're both. Um, and uh, in, in the governance, it is reflected in the sense that uh, we have at least one member coming from an environment of research infrastructures. Um, so, um, I think research infrastructures are very much in, in, in the core of the thinking of, of a lot that is ongoing at the moment. We, uh, we look particularly at the newly formed cluster projects for the research infrastructures to also engage with them to make sure that their input into the EOSC is taken on board very early on. Yeah, I'm not sure you can hear me, but um, uh, I, I, I definitely agree with what, uh, what Katrin said. Research infrastructures will be, can be both uh, users and, and, and providers. And yes, of course, they are, they are represented in the, in the governance um, and at, at various levels. And, and we know that the cluster projects have their own kind of links into the, into the EOS governance. And last but not least, I mean, there are members of the, of the stakeholder forum or, or platforms uh, in, in, in the future. So it's, it's, it's being sure that, this, uh, their, that their input is heard. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was Rupert too, who's joined us. Rupert Luke, who's the, uh, the chair of the co-chair of the sustainability working group. Thank you, Rupert. Okay. Um, the, there's a couple of, well, one, one question about um, um, thematic clouds in particular. The, the EC is planning to build a health research and innovation cloud in the coming years to make health research data fair. Um, this is supposed to contribute to the European Open Science Cloud. Um, how, how is this going to be um, coordinated? So how is the relationship between the European Open Science Cloud and this, uh, and this um, health, health cloud uh, going to, going to um, roll out? So I don't think it's something we've discussed um, at great detail yet, um, but I think it is really critical that these thematic clouds feed in. So there was a, a group that ran last year around a transport research cloud and identifying user needs for that. Um, and I think these kind of thematic clouds or pillars um, are really critical to feed into the EOS. And certainly with the health um, cloud, it, it picks up on some of those questions we were addressing earlier around, you know, the sensitive data and GDPR, and making sure that we have um, an EOSC that works for different user communities and different um, research needs. And I think that's something that will come out of um, the FAIR group as well, looking at you know, what the disciplinary practices and the, the methods for data sharing and, and making sure that we enable those within the EOSC. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So what we'll do now is we'll, um, we'll put the questions and answers on, on hold now and um, we'll move over to uh, Andrea Grisilla, uh, who is the project manager for, for the EOSC Secretariat uh, project. Uh, and then after, after his presentation's overview of, of which gives an overview of the your secretariat project and, and our position there, uh, we'll come back to, to final questions and answers at the end. Okay, so um, Andre, I hand over to you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, now an official good morning to all of you, to all the participants, listeners, and series of these presentations and to my colleagues in the consortium and in the executive board. So as said by Nick, I'm the project manager of the EOSCsecretariat.eu project, which is basically the project underlying the constitution of the administrative and organizational and also financial support to the initiatives of the uh, EOSC governance. 
broadly speaking, and which has uh, indeed the aim of supporting the EU's governance. And uh, I ask Nick, next slide, please. Thank you. As this, here you have a very short description of what we are aiming to achieve in the two years and a half of life of our project, which started January this year and will end uh, end of June 2020. As I have mentioned, the EOSC Secretariat has the specific aim of supporting the EOS governance, offering to the community of the stakeholders the structures and the tools to participate and to co-create actually uh, EOSC in the years to come. Uh, we have uh, found our uh, uh, raison d'etre in the implementation roadmap which is the official document issued by the European Commission in 2018, setting up the uh, uh, governance and financial aspects on which the EOSC is going to be uh, built in the next uh, years. And we have uh, our uh, final objective of bringing the community of stakeholders into EUSC so that at the end of the process, EUSC will be a real open cloud uh, run by the users. Next slide, please. Well, uh, how do the uh, Secretariat achieve this objective? Well, uh, the uh, support to the EOS governance is mainly directed to the delivery and the establishment of processes, procedures, rules, the models and the legal framework for the EOS. And this can be done by uh, placing in the middle of the network of the big network that is uh, being built around EOS which means to, through receiving inputs from the, and from the EOSC executive board, receiving guidelines and other inputs from the EOSC working groups as described by Catherine and Sarah before me, and also by uh, receiving uh, feedback, comments, and additional inputs from the stakeholders forum. Outputs from the uh, Secretariat are uh, mainly directed to the coordination of the services to the working groups, coordination with the other EOSC projects that are uh, uh, taking uh, place and uh, have started in the uh, recent times and are going to start also in the next months. Uh, there will be open consultations, a knowledge base, events, especially two annual events uh, comp uh, comprising the stakeholders forum, meetings, uh, running a website, and especially always trying to build a solid community of engaged uh, stakeholders. Next slide. Uh, this slide has already been uh, shown by Catherine and her presentation, but uh, I want to uh, stress where the uh, uh, secretariat position lies. I like to see this image as a sort of uh, Greek temple where you have three columns made of the boards steering actually physically and giving guidelines to the building of the, uh, of the ears with the stakeholder forum and working groups advising on implementations. Uh, uh, smaller initiatives like projects and national funded project initiatives or the coalition of doers, again from their side contributed to the implementation of the EU's governance, but all resting uh, and being based on the foundational ground of the EU's secretariat, which is there really to support the governance and the building of EUSC in the years to come. Next slide. This is the uh, timeline for the governance framework as it has been said uh, uh, coming from the 
um, EOSC implementation uh, roadmap, uh, we have already settled some, set some objectives for the 2019 and, and uh, 2020. And uh, I can say that uh, what had to be achieved in the first three quarters of 2019 uh, uh, has been actually uh, achieved. Uh, uh, as you've seen, uh, the working groups have been established and the activities uh, have, uh, uh, been, have uh, recently kicked off. Uh, the strategic implementation plan and the work plan have been delivered and will be published on the EX Secretariat very soon. And we are now in the phase of mapping national initiatives through the working group of landscape and other uh, initiatives taken inside the EOSC Secretariat. And we are in this very moment planning the uh, event of the Stakeholder Forum, and you will hear about that later in my presentation. Next slide. The, as said, the EOSC Secretariat is an Horizon 2020 project and, um, and the consortium running the Secretariat is made of 11 partners. The coordinator of the project is Tenopolis Group and uh, other partners are coming from the research world, universities, research infrastructures, foundations, uh, and uh, all, all these kinds of uh, stakeholders already in the uh, EOSC community. Next slide, please. Which are the guiding principles of the EOSC secretariat? First of all, we want to stress our independence and neutrality for, uh, from any vested interest in the community because we really want to stress uh, our uh, being in, uh, there as channel, main channel for the community out there, for your community, your community of stakeholders to reach uh, the governance of the uh, of EOSC, to be part of the governance and to have your voice heard. We are working, of course, under the supervision of the executive board. Uh, at this time, we are having an interim character because at the end of the project, we want to set the uh, guidelines of how the, uh, the real EOSC secretariat has to be based on which kind of uh, rules and sets of standards. We are supporting a user-centric EOSC implementation. We want to be flexible and agile, and of course, all our activity is based on the criteria of transparency and openness. What can you do as stakeholders in order to support the progress of the EOSC? We, uh, through, the, through the EOSC Secretariat, you can uh, suggest studies to be commissioned uh, in order to support the work, especially of the uh, working groups. At this very moment, the EOSC Secretariat has already confirmed as topics to be investigated through studies, uh, thanks to the um, funds that have been provided by the European Commission uh, to the budget granted to the Secretariat. I said we are uh, confirmed, we are now investigative innovative business models, rules of participation for service providers and users, and we are also uh, starting a study on legal and organizational framework for sustainable governance. The working groups and the executive board may ask in the next months to the uh, secretariat to start other studies based on the needs of these bodies. And again, please, the stakeholders are very much invited to outline, to suggest, to identify which kind of topics may be of any interest in order to uh, be of help to uh, support the progress on the building of the European Open Science Cloud. Next slide. Uh, uh, the European Commission has uh, granted to the Secretariat an amount of uh, money with a budget that is called co-creation budget. By this, 
uh, we mean that we want the stakeholders community to uh, be uh, responsible and to find motivated to design and deliver with us, with us the project of creating and building the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, which means that the stakeholders uh, can uh, send uh, to the Secretariat uh, requests for financing and funding initiatives that can uh, support the establishment of EUSC. Uh, this, uh, who can apply for these co-creation uh, activities? Uh, applicants can be individuals or natural persons residing in the member states of the European Union, including outermost regions and associated countries. Applicants have to notify that they are not receiving support from other instruments like EU or national research infrastructure projects for the same, especially they are not receiving support for the kind of activities they want to uh, be funded. And they are not also funded from other sources for the, exactly for the identical activities that, for, for which they are sending their request. Next slide. Uh, the requests uh, will be then uh, evaluated by the Secretariat. Criteria are the same of the Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, activities and actions which are related to the work of the EOS Secretariat to support the EOS governance will, of course, receive the uh, priority in being financed. Uh, the um, applications they have to demonstrate that the activities to be funded are bringing added values to existing EOSC activities and uh, benefits uh, for the EOSC are, have to be quantified through the KPIs that the EOSC Secretariat are going to set in the uh, next days. So uh, if stakeholders are interested to uh, send any application for an EOSC-related activity to be funded, as an example, uh, stakeholder engagement events or uh, studies, or for example, meetings between the stakeholders and the EOSC uh, executive boards, or uh, datathons, uh, or uh, activities uh, of this kind, uh, requests are going to be sent through the EOSC Secretariat website to uh, the coordinator of the, of the project. The EOSC Secretariat will evaluate and analyze the consistency of the uh, uh, request and possibility of adjustments or, or for providing additional uh, enlightening uh, details uh, can be given to the applicant and then the Secretariat steering group, basically the, all, the pro, all the project partners, will evaluate, assess and finally approve or uh, reject the request. Uh, the full process uh, can last from 30 to uh, 45 days. Next slide, please. Uh, the Secretariat uh, wants to offer to the stakeholders uh, a huge, uh, a plenty of ways to uh, engage. Uh, our plan uh, is uh, really for you, for the stakeholders, to join the dialogue across the, with the EOSC governance and uh, to facilitate the dialogue among you stakeholders through uh, many ways like the blogs, events, the webinars, this is the first of a series, videos and newsletter. Uh, uh, the EOSC Secretariat is going to um, be present in many events. Uh, we are going to set an EOSC kiosk in uh, uh, many uh, of events like uh, the ones that you're going to hear in, in a minute. And we really want uh, you to help us uh, in shaping uh, the EUs. Next slide. Uh, 
for the opportunities that we want to stress uh, right now uh, we uh, are two at uh, this very moment. One has been already mentioned by Catherine, the International Research Data Community contributing to EOSC which is an EOSC event in a, a, the RDA Helsinki plenary on the 22nd of October. And then a NEOSC Secretariat event, which is the EOSC Sympo since Stakeholders uh, Symposium 2019, which will take place in Budapest at the end of November. So this is it for the time being and more will uh, come in the future and so we invited you we will invite you to stay tuned okay thank you very much andre thank you that's a very comprehensive overview i think so what we'll do now for the last uh, for the last few minutes for the webinar is try to get through as many questions as possible um, there's there's obviously a lot of interest in the working groups so uh so the executive board members, can you still uh, be ready for questions, basically? So the first one, very important, we mentioned um, uh, openness and, and, and transparency. So the question is, would, will there be a, a list of the working group members made available publicly? Yes, yeah, there, there will be. So we, we've already gathered the bios for the fair working group. Um, and we hope to get all the relevant permissions to put them online at our first meeting on the 4th of July. Um, and I know the other working groups are, are starting to do similar work. So I think over the summer, there should be details about all the different members. Um, and certainly for those where there is an open call, um, you will need to know the existing members to know what representatives there already are and what skills gaps there are. Yes, thank you, Sarah. We'll, and also, just to add, we'll be we'll be publishing the the, the list of the members on the your secretary website in mm -hmm. uh, in a very short space of time. Basically, you know, now that a number have been uh, confirmed. Okay, so the the, the next question is actually uh, regards the the fair group, mm -hmm. um, and uh, how does the fair group relate to the fair's fair project? <laughs> um, so closely, I would say. Um, so all of these working groups, one thing I would stress about them is that we aren't there to reinvent wheels. We're not going to be doing work that's separate to what all of these different projects and initiatives are doing. We're really just trying to help coordinate um, and and push forward um, key outputs for for the EOSC. Um, so Fair's Fair has a really um, important role to play in terms of the fair working group because it's it's the major fair project it already itself has a lot of relevant outputs for for our working group um it's doing work on metrics for example on repository certification um, it's doing a whole load of landscaping work at the moment um it's also trying to coordinate across all the different um, projects that have an element around fair data so all of the um in for EOSC4 cluster projects um, have a work package on FAIR and the national initiatives, the, the 5B projects it is, I think, um, they all have elements of FAIR as well. And FAIR's FAIR is trying to synthesize those. So there'll be a really key um, project, a key kind of locus point for us to, to connect out. Thank you, Sarah. So the next question link, linked to this actually is, um, will the question of machine readable no, sorry, the machine actionable data management plans um, be handled by any of the working groups. Um, uh -huh. in, in it, would that be something that would be covered by the by the fair working group? Uh, yeah, so, so I would see this as falling under um, the kind of practice um, within different research communities um, and just one element of the kind of tooling suite that researchers would need. Um, so things around DMPs as well as lab notebooks. I think this kind of thing is something that would bridge between um, the FAIR group and the architecture group. Um, but yeah, it's certainly an element of what needs to be provided in EOSC. And it's something that was picked up in the um, Turning Fair into Reality um, report. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, quite a practical question now. Um, this is specifically regarding your group, uh, Sarah. So uh, the question is, um, how is it possible to participate as a stakeholder representative of the cultural 
cultural heritage sector in the FAIR implementation working group? Uh huh. Um, so I think there are a few ways. Obviously, we've already got a number of members. We will have an open call. Um, and I'm just trying to think through our members. I don't think we have very many people from a cultural heritage background. Um, so I think it's definitely worth applying because you'd be bringing a different um, set of skills. But there are lots of ways to engage, not just being members of the group. Um, I mentioned that we'll be um, reaching out and interacting uh, with all the different initiatives going on in this space. Um, we still need to discuss exactly how we'll do that, um, both with the working group members when we meet on the 4th of July, but also with the EOS Secretariat, which has a whole work package around stakeholder engagement. Uh, but what I would envisage is that we'd be having um, some kind of online um, forum. So there is a stakeholder forum where people would be able to either submit ideas or give feedback on, on plans. Um, I expect we will be doing more webinars as well. And there are already um, some existing workshops taking place. So we'll be running a two hour session on FAIR at the event at the RDA plenary. And there will be something on FAIR in the EOS symposium program as well. Um, one idea I have, this is to be agreed with the working group members, is that we would possibly have a workshop in parallel like the day before one of our meetings, just so we can engage with all the relevant projects and gather inputs. Um, but obviously we'd need to think about the logistics and whether that fits for various people and whether it's an appropriate thing to do. But there will be lots of ways to engage. And if people have ideas of how they want to engage with us, um, we'd be very happy to hear them. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, you, you raised an important point about the engagement also on online and this, um, through the, the, the US Secretariat uh, project, we, we hope to put, we will be putting up an online kind of, uh, forum, a place where people can, um, can discuss some of the topics coming out of the working groups and in particular, uh, targeting the various stakeholders uh, that, we, that we saw at the beginning of the the, uh, the 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 webinar, you know, the, the spread of people that EOSC is 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 trying to uh, trying to engage with. So there'll be um, uh, the opportunity on our website, but there'll also be the opportunity at events, as I was said, uh, organised by uh, by the secretariat, but also in, in in tandem with some of these working group meetings as well, which will be will be taking place. And we'll also be holding regular webinars where we we hope to um, you know attract. The number of people that we've had on there today, which is which is fantastic. So, um, and another question on on engagement um, is, how do you expect university CIOs and IT managers to support or cooperate with the European Open Science Cloud? I feel like I'm dominating questions. So I don't know if anyone else wants to answer. Well, I was going to say through your national structures. Um, I think it is. it needs to be really clear that the European Open Science Cloud is going to be an overlay on the European level. Uh, universities are national institutions and they are part of their national open science infrastructure that is either built already, being built, being integrated. And I think it is very important that um, um, IT groups, uh, CIOs on the university level actually uh, inform themselves what's happening nationally in the, in the data infrastructures that are being built, um, integrated. Um, so I think you need to become part of your national conversation. Mm -hmm. And then nationally it will come together on a European level, of course. Yeah. And I, I think all of these stakeholders play a really important role. You know, research institutions is they're the, the kind of front face, really. That's where researchers are based. It's, it's where the research is happening. So it's really critical that, that those people have a role to play in EOSC. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so engagement there is, is key. The, another question to uh, another stakeholder audience is, um, which is the best way for other EU projects, so perhaps not the, not the projects which are directly um, targeting the, or have their, their work focused around um, the EOSC. So how do other EU projects related to data management get involved with the European Open Science Cloud? I would 
say one of the really key areas to get involved is um, in things like the rules of participation, um, the architecture and the fair working group, because they're like the delivery side of the EOSC, I would say, whereas the, the sustainability and landscape are, are a little bit more strategic looking at the member state level and, and the mappings and, and models to be put in place there. But if somebody's doing something practical around data management, it would be good for those inputs to feed in to the EOSC. Um, and I think whether they're developing something that could be offered as a service, they would have views on the rules of participation they would want to play by, or if they're potentially a user of EOS services, again, they'd have views on, on what their expectations are. So I think that's the rules is a really good starting place, um, but then also to engage in, in both mine and Jean-Francois's group. Okay, thank you very much. And another stakeholder group are those who are not in Europe. Um, so there are a number of projects carrying out activities in non-EU countries, for example, Africa. Mm -hmm. um, how can these projects collaborate with the European Open Science Cloud? Yeah, so Katri may want to speak here because I know she does a lot of work in Africa as well. But um, through the, the Research Data Alliance, we've been um, doing a number of BOF sessions around coordinating um, global open science platforms or commonses. Um, and we've actually now got to a stage where we've drafted um, an interest group and a working group um, proposal. Um, we expect to have um, our, our first kind of working session uh, at the plenary in Helsinki. Um, there is also um, a session that's been submitted to the Codata conference in Beijing. And I think it's really critical that we don't just look at things in our silos. We're not just looking at this is Europe and how it works for Europe. We need to be engaging internationally and checking that our practices and, and methods can interoperate with others because research is global. Um, so I think this is why I personally think it's really important we have international members on these working groups as well, even though Europe isn't their remit. Um, we need to make sure that what we're doing works internationally. And I think RDA is a really important forum to, to drive that agenda. Just if I may, Jan speaking. Yeah. We shall also not forget that several of the research infrastructures have significant international outreach or are even located outside of Europe. And this contribution uh, where the, the international user will have access through these research infrastructures shall not be underestimated. And please allow me also to say that the EOSC Secretariat is also uh, very much into the international stakeholder uh, activity and uh, one of the key aspects and elements that the uh, European uh, uh, Commission has given us as task is really about reaching out uh, all the stakeholders that are uh, outside Europe to map their activities and to connect them with the EOSC in Europe. Yes, thank you. Yeah, in fact, there, there is work in, in Secretariat in looking at best practices in particular. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you. Now, I think one, one more question. Um, so talking of the EOSC portal, um, there are a lot of questions coming in on how input in terms of new functionalities and services can be fed into the, new, into the current EOSC portal. Um, so we wanted your, your, your opinion on that. I think I should take this one. Uh, Sarah, <clears throat> so uh, we're launching the working group and among, uh, among the, the, the initial uh, mission uh, of, the, of the architecture working group is uh, looking at uh, how we can evolve the portal. So uh, I mean, uh, if my recollection is correct, it's, it was an, uh, in the slide on architecture as an explicit, uh, explicit topic. So we will address that uh, as soon as uh, the architecture working group is launched. So yes, there is a need for the, the portal that was uh, announced in November last year was a, a first version and there is a lot to do uh, in order to improve it and to make it uh, uh, you know, a universal tool. Thank you, Jean-Francois. So, uh, and, and another, yeah. 
one quick thing to add to that. As far as I understand, there will be a project working on that specifically as well. I think it's Infra EOSC 6 or something. Um, so there, there will be some key inputs that will feed into Jean-Francois's group to support that. Or, or, or output. Uh, uh, mm. yeah. Thank you, Sarah, to, to add that. Uh, so this project will have the resource in order to uh, improve uh, the portal and the uh, requirements and uh, will come both from uh, Sarah in terms of uh, fair um, uh, fair ability of the of the services and uh, from us uh, uh, the architecture working group in terms of uh, of uh, integration in the overall EOSC. But yes, it's important to know that there will be resources available uh, in this project in order to implement uh, what we will collectively decide. Wonderful, thank you, Jean-Francois, again. So I think we'll have, to, we'll have two more questions because uh, more and more are coming in. So um, the first one is, um, is there any formal link between your European Open Science Cloud and EuroHPC? And how do these two articulate their relationship? Um. I, I'm not entirely sure if anybody from the European Commission is on this call. Um, I believe this, uh, the particulars in that relationship are still being discussed uh, in, in Brussels. And um, I don't think that any, anybody from the executive board at this point in time um, could go into the detail of how that relationship will be formalized in the future. I think it is appreciated that there is a relationship and there must be one but how that is going to pan out precisely in the funding relationship between Horizon Europe and Digital Europe, I'm not entirely sure if that's decided yet, and uh, that's certainly to be decided in Brussels. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. I think a lot of the, the questions we're, we're looking at here, so um, on Andrea's slide, uh, he mentioned the, the, the EOSC symp uh, stakeholder symposium in, in November in Budapest, and a lot of these you know, questions we're getting in and questions we'll gather at future webinars events can really feed into these engagement events that we have coming up in the next few months. So uh, thank, you for the, thank you for those questions. Um, now, finally, one, one last question um, regards um, the success indicators. So what would be the success indicators helping us to decide at the end of the 2020 milestone if the if the Horizon 2020 results of realizing the European Open Science Cloud are to be considered a success or not? Um, so I can give a couple of observations. Um, obviously, you've seen in the slide the what we've put as like the minimum viable platform, the key elements that we've got in our work plan to um, address. So obviously, the delivery of those elements. Um, but for me, a success factor is the fact that we have users who are satisfied users and who see this as a viable um, space to work in. Um, so I, th I think it will be really important to do that stakeholder engagement to define the user needs and, and be able to actually evidence that we're addressing those. Um, within um, our, our kind of contracts for the EOSC executive board, um, we do have um, I can't remember if it's quarter three or quarter four this year, but um, we do have elements to essentially assess progress um, and to, to kind of benchmark where we are. So we will be defining a set of KPIs um, and I think we will take specific inputs from the core EOSC projects like EOSC Secretariat to, to look at KPIs there. Um, but it would be, that's something that I would be interested to hear stakeholder observations on as well about what is a success factor for you because that's how we should be measuring ourselves. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank um, all of our participants for, for joining us and also for sending in your questions. And um, we will try to get back to you. Clearly, we couldn't answer all questions that we've received because there was you know, over 300 people on the call today, on the webinar today. Uh, but we'll try to get back to you on, on all of the questions uh, as soon as possible. Um, I'd like to 
in particular thank all of our speakers, so in particular Catherine Stover and uh, Sarah Jones for presenting the executive board and the working groups. And I'd also like to thank Andrea for presenting the USC um, Secretary project. I'd also like to thank all of the working group chairs who stayed on the call and answered the questions. And I saw answer questions in the chat. So thank you, Jean-Francois Abramatic, Jan Hrusak, Rupert Luck, and, uh, and I'd like to also thank my, my two colleagues, Ali and Abdul uh, Marino and Sara Garavelli, who have been fielding all of your questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, um, please do register uh, on the EOS Secretary website. We'll have a, a newsletter coming out regularly where you can keep up to date with what's happening in, uh, with the EOS governance, in particular with the working groups, and also the engagement events that we've mentioned a lot um, in today's webinar. It's very important that we do create a dialogue um, between the governance and uh, the various stakeholder communities. So please do uh, register, register with us. All of the slides um, will be available on the EOS Secretariat website straight after this webinar. Uh, and we'll, we'll send a message out to you as well um, with a link to them. So with that, I'd like to close the webinar and uh, thank everybody once again for, for participating. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.